Good evening, everybody. As uh, you've heard, I'm Mark Auslander. I'm an anthropologist, and tonight I'd like to share a puzzle that I've been struggling over for the last 10 years. Why do people sometimes reenact not events that they're proud of or that they take great joy in remembering, but events that are enormously painful in their, in their community's history, human rights atrocities? And I'll talk especially about uh, tonight uh, about uh, uh, traumatic racial violence uh, reenactments uh, that we see more and more across the United States. Very surprising. Rather different than the Civil War reenactments that many of us are familiar with that celebrate bravery and victory, may show people uh, reenacting or performing death, but don't reenact human rights atrocities most of the time. And yet, this has been happening more and more. We'll talk about these two examples that we see here. On, uh, on, uh, on your right, you see uh, an, uh, a case that has happened for 10 years, every year, a reenactment of a lynching, uh, a terrible mass murder that took place in 1946 and that has been reenacted for 10 years every July, this, this, this time of the year. Uh, uh, you also see another reenactment that I'll discuss that took place only one time, a reenactment of a slave auction in St. Louis, Missouri. And I'll start with that one. This is a very fascinating case. Uh, it took place in January 2011. The 150th anniversary year of the Civil War was beginning, and many African Americans in St. Louis, Missouri, felt that there was a tendency to forget that slavery was at the historical foundation of the Civil War, uh, that there was a sort of celebration that wasn't really going into the serious causes of the war. And they thought, what better place to remember this than the federal courthouse in downtown St. Louis, directly under the Great Arch, and this is where many of the Dred Scott trials, of course, that ruled that African Americans were, uh, had no constitutional rights. Those infamous trials were held. What better place on these very stairs where, in fact, many, many families have been sold apart for a 50-year period leading up to the Civil War, what better place than to remind uh, the community, to remind the nation of the horrors of slave auctions, the horrors of slavery? This is a very difficult event to, uh, to organize. As you can see, uh, uh, on just the kind of sort of box where an auction might have taken place, that's where uh, very carefully costumed performers reenacting the parts of enslaved people, of slave owners, of buyers, even of some abolitionist protesters uh, gathered. Each reenactor uh, playing the role of an enslaved person developed uh, their, their background, their story, as it were, and uh, performed magnificently, very bravely, this terrible role. We, we see heartbreaking stories uh, through this event of families, of mothers and daughters, as we see in this picture, being torn apart. It was almost impossible to watch for the 25 minutes that it went on, and yet it was gripping. 600 people, whites, white folks, African Americans, and others gathered and began to talk to one another and murmur and discuss how, how outrageous this was, and yet nobody felt they could, they could look away. At the end of it, after about a half hour, uh, it was called to a halt, uh, and it was extraordinary. The performers, who had been for weeks and weeks rehearsing this, all clutched each other. St. Louis is in many ways still a very segregated town. Of course, Ferguson, Ferguson has been in all our minds for the past year, one of the suburbs. A lot of racial violence, a lot of racial tension, a lot of segregation. And yet this process of working together, of facing up to the nation's original sin through these performances, and this involved, by the way, many white folks who were Confederate reenactors who had decided to help out their African-American brothers and sisters in the reenactment community, this led to extraordinary conversations. And after that reenactment, and this is the, the most extraordinary thing, everybody went into the center of the courthouse, an enormous rotunda, 600 people gathered, and this is a town where it's very hard to have uh, true uh, cross-racial conversations. Victoria, who you see here, sang a beautiful hymn, Lord, how come, I'm, how come me here, a famous spiritual. You couldn't hear anybody. Nobody could even breathe after that. And then there was an open mic that was passed around, and so many people spoke what was in their heart, the, the terrible feelings that they'd felt being an auctioneer, being sold off, watching a mother and daughter torn apart. Through, uh, through the economics of slavery. And then the conversation transitioned in a very fascinating way to contemporary issues in race relations and social relations in St. Louis, education, police brutality, especially job training for young African-American men, the incarceration rate. Didn't solve everything, but it was a very fascinating moment 
And many people talked about this. They'd never had a frank conversation with many of their neighbors across the lines of race until this particular moment. So it's fascinating as, uh, that sometimes we feel called upon to go into the deepest recesses of the human heart, those darkest places, and then work through it together and come out and finally have frank and serious conversations about, about race, about difference, and how to build a just community. So I've been fascinated all these years with many other reenactments. But the most difficult and fascinating one of all of these has been in a little place in Georgia, oh, about 50 miles outside of Atlanta, a place known as Moore's Ford. And uh, 69 years ago, just this, uh, well, next week, uh, was, it was the site of one of the most terrible mass killings in American history. Uh, two young African-American couples uh, were ambushed. This was during a sum the summer of 1946. There was systematic targeting by the Klan of African-American uh, returned uh, service uh, members who'd fought in World War II quite heroically uh, and who were demanding the right to vote in uh, gubernatorial elections and so forth. They were targeted for killing, uh, for, for, for beatings, and in many cases for murder. And the most dramatic was this killing in which, as I say, four young African-Americans, including one uh, returned serviceman, uh, uh, was, uh, was br were brutally murdered. For years and years, the, there had been a cross-racial conversation in, in, in this community uh, between uh, near Monroe, Georgia, about perhaps bringing this long-running cold case to justice. Uh, it never happened. The FBI, FBI has recently reopened investigations. Uh, it is widely believed that many of the 15 uh, Klansmen lived really until quite recently. There may be one or two still walking around, but there's never been a successful indictment or prosecution. There have been, of course, many uh, solved uh, cold cases in the civil rights movement, but this is the great unsolved case. So finally, 10 years ago, African-American civil rights movements working with, workers, uh, working with their white allies decided they needed to do something about this, stage a reenactment. Uh, as tough as that this would be to call attention to this crime, to encourage witnesses to come forward, and to honor the dead. Here you see the first reenactment. Uh, the original plan had actually been that white members of the community, 15 white men, had, had volunteered uh, to play the role of Klansmen. That morning, all of them called in sick. They couldn't bring themselves to do it. Some of them were actually terrified that, their, uh, white, that some of their relatives who may have been involved in the lynching would come after them. Others just couldn't face uh, the horror of reenacting a lynching. But the community, the African-American community, felt, felt this was so important and as you see, the African-American men in the community, working class guys, many of them farm workers, uh, mechanics, and so forth, went to a local theatrical goods store, got these theatrical masks so they could become white men, they could become Klansmen for the day. It was the most difficult thing they said they'd ever done. They had to scream the N-word, they had to beat up on, on the women, for example, in the community, scream at them and, and reenact trying to kill them. Uh, it was very hard. Many of them say they still, 10 years later, have nightmares about this. Uh, that the, because they discovered something terrible within themselves. They never imagined that they could do this kind of violence. But as they were reenacting it and shouting the N-word and so forth, they found a kind of rage mounting within themselves and they began to imagine how in a crowd they themselves could have become perpetrators of this terrible uh, human rights atrocity. So uh, uh, the next year they felt they needed to do the reenactment again, but none of them felt they could play the role of the Klansmen. And they reached out to the white community actually to the, to the church community, especially to the peace and justice community, to progressive folks in, uh, in Atlanta and, and, and Athens came and had to be taught by the African-American community how to act like Klansmen, how to shout the N-word, how to, how to how, it, very, it was very strange at rehearsals, you can imagine. Uh, no, that's not how you break a black man's arm with a rifle butt. It was almost impossible to watch. Uh, it was at times humorous because humor, of course, is the only God-given gift we have. Uh, to deal with these horrors. And at one moment, a, a woman who was, learnt, who was teaching an, a, a white guy how to say uh, terrible things about black women uh, was pleased that he was learning how to do it, but also horrified. And as she was leaving and putting on her coat to go out, she said, I just want you all to know, you all are the nicest group of white supremacists I've ever had the pleasure of working with. <laughs> uh, and it, it was the, a little bit of a bar, but also, of course, humor uh, as a way of working through, uh, through this. I'll mention this fascinating car. You'll notice that, that while in the St. Louis reenactment, everybody was very careful to have exactly the sequence right and every costume right, that's not true for, lynching, for this lynching reenactment. Most people wear street clothes. That's especially true for the African-American reenactors. 
who want to emphasize that, yes, this thing happened back in 1946, but it also hap has been happening day in and day out since 1620, a story of slavery, of Jim Crow, all the way up to the present moment, that you can be pulled over driving while black, that uh, all of us are really at risk in the community, they emphasize. And so this story is not just about the past, it's about the here and now. It's, of course, about Charleston. It's about Michael Brown for, for this community. Therefore, although every year uh, sort of wealthy donors say, oh, we'll get you a beautiful 1937 uh, uh, sedan or something like that that can be historically accurate, the community likes to use this 1977 Lincoln Town Car. It needs to be a little old, but not too old, because the emphasis, this is the kind of car we could still be driving. And there are wonderful stories about this, about this car, which is well beloved. Uh, a particular African-American gentleman got off a white, a white man for 50 bucks when it was on, was on blocks. Who ever thought he'd get it working again? And so there's a lot of pride in the community. Uh, but this is also the most heart-wrenching scene as four young African-American uh, changes every year are being driven to the ambush point. A thousand people sometimes gather to watch this. And it is a terrible thing to behold, of course, as the uh, members of the white community who have trained and trained over the months to learn how to act like Klansmen act. These are not professional actors. They're all figuring out as they go along, uh, pulling down, uh, down the embankment to the riverbank where the terrible murder took place. Uh, 60 bullet holes approximately were found in each of those four young, uh, four young victims. Uh, you'll notice, though, that there's a lot of collaborative work uh, a num there are not enough white men who are, who are willing to play Klansmen, so every year uh, some white women have to, have to take the role of being Klansmen. There's an African-American woman who's very committed to this, wearing the blonde wig, uh, and every year it changes a little bit. It's very hard to watch. It is almost impossible at a certain point as we move towards the point where the noose is, is hung over the gentleman that plays Roger Malcolm, the principal victim, who was accused of getting in a fight with a white farmer, uh, and his best friend, uh, who, as I say, had been a war hero coming back in the U.S. Army. Uh, and their common law wives are lined up. They're shot at repeatedly by those that are playing the Klansmen. Uh, and it is uh, every year, even if you know it's coming, almost impossible to watch. But what's fascinating is that although there's a script, nobody ever stays with the script. There's a lot of experimentation. And the very first year this happened, uh, Rachel, who you see here, uh, who's a woman in the, lo in the local uh, Baptist church, felt called upon to come up around the, quote, bodies of the dead, who were just supposed to lie there quietly as everybody was taking pictures. And she said, we can't allow, we can't allow our loved ones, because this isn't just, she said, the people that died in 46. It's all the people that died in slavery times. It's all of our, it's my son who was killed in a drive-by. It's, uh, it's all of our loved ones who are suffering. We have to honor them. And she started to sing. And the song she sang was really quite moving and important. It was, it was Precious Lord, uh, Martin Luther King's favorite hymn, of course, was sung at his funeral, so that the dead would not die alone. So what does all this tell us? Why do people do this? All reenactors want to, of course, uh, encourage people to think about the history, to learn the truth of American history that we often forget about. But it's more than that. And there's an ama amazing moment when, when Michael, who we saw there, was actually lying on the ground, uh, uh, having pictures taken of him. And then a moment later, he rose up and he said, we come back to life. We come back to life. And he said this with wonder in his, uh, in his eyes. And I think that's the point. All of us, and this is as an anthropologist, I study, I, I've lived for many years in Africa, I've lived in communities around the world, and a very common human impulse is to connect with the dead, to connect with our, with our loved ones who are no longer with us, and to exchange, to go temporarily into the world, that other world of the dead, and to come back regenerated. And we're all doing that again and again, especially at this during this very difficult year, since the killing of Michael Brown. Uh, this is nothing new in American history, but we're, we're now dramatically, I think, especially since the Charleston killings, all reflecting on this together as a nation. How do we build a just society? And here we see, as messy, as sometimes as or unorganized as these reenactments are, they are very genuine grassroots attempts to connect with those that are lost, to, to take on the, the pain of those that we have forgotten about, that have been written out of the history books, and put them in our very flesh. That's why this isn't just about writing a story. It's not even about making a play or a movie. It's about saying right here in this place where the slave auction happened, where this terrible murder happened, we're going to do this again and again 
both to honor the dead, but also in honoring the dead, to all come back together, to live again and to reflect on what does it really mean to live as a community. That's a hard kind of job. That's a hard piece of work to stand up and say, I have suffered. I've taken on someone else's suffering. I've entered into that other world of pain. But we can step out and together come back to life, look into one another's eyes, see the other in, our, uh, in ourselves, the self in the other, and together build a just community. Thank you. <laughs>